Sounds like me early in the morning. I can feel spring, we can smell spring, and I can taste spring in my favorite food grouping, maple syrup. Good morning. Pardon? And, and women can have it too. That's for Renee. Good morning to everyone here at Halliburton United Church and to all those watching this service on YouTube. And we know they're from Halliburton to Peterborough to Sudbury and beyond. When we often wring our hands about the population in churches on Sunday, I think we can be really quite full of heartwarming thoughts when we see the number of friends and families watching online. I think that provides us with some sense of hope. The announcements have been run, and as you know, the ministry for this month is the young lady now that we have helped through uh, World Vision in Cambodia. And I have a letter here that I've been asked to read from the Hellenic Ministries. This is, if we all remember, Nancy's niece. And she says, Dear Pastor Harry and friends at Halliburton United Church, thank you for giving us the opportunity to share with you what God is doing here in Greece. We were very moved by your very generous gift of $721.40 to support our family. It's because of supporters like you that we are able to continue serving here in Greece. We wish we could thank each of you individually. May God bless you. Please continue to keep us in your prayers with Christian love and much appreciation, Emily and family. We often don't hear from this, the charities in that kind of a way, so it's really heartwarming to read it. Our opening prayer. Please join me in the prayer. Creator God, our gracious Father, we prepare a new way in the wilderness and water in the desert. Help us to recognize your hand, working miracles beyond our imagining. Open our hearts to be transformed, the new thing you are doing, so that our lives may proclaim extravagances of your love for all. And in our presence, in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. 22. We tied, tied last week. Perfect. Thanks, Ben. How many do they have in Lachlan? 31 in Lachlan. No, 10. It's 30. He said 31. 31 uh, devices hooked up online here. That's a, so. Thanks, Leslie. Morning to everybody and uh, welcome. It must be spring because Michael's wearing his shorts, so we know it's 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 time. <laughs> and Leslie has her little car out. And Leslie has her little car out, so definitely, the salt must have diminished on the roads a little bit. We got. Um, I just want to see who all's here. We've got uh, Shirley and and uh, Jake Venner down in Inglesby, and Lisa and Christian. My son says top of the morning to ye. I guess he's still, he's still in St. Patty's mode, that guy. Uh, Cheryl Russell and Jen and Paul Burke, Peggy Morgan, um, Ernie and L uh, Linda Collette, they're saying, may you join in praying for peace for Ukraine. Paul and Nancy send greetings from Woodland Acres. I guess that's where they live. Okay. Alan Galt, um, Alan and Sharon are saying, looking forward to the sermon on the other sun. By the way, D uh, Doug just came in, so that makes it 23. Uh, Lynn Ritchie and John from Pine Lake. They've got computer in Goodrum. <laughs> Who knew? Joy Cooper, and she says hi from Bonnie in Peterborough and Lindsay in Wales. Doug and Ruth Mitchell. Liz and Gary Matthews at Lutterworth and Jan Tedford in Blairhampton. She says, can hear the chatter of everyone at church. It's drawing people, you see. That's the thing. Sue Nicholson, Randy Birch, and from uh, up at Kinesis Lake, and Sharon Carr. That's good. Good game. Thanks for joining us, folks. See, that's them right there. Yes. Good job. <laughs> um, okay. Now my my instructions say Harry does whatever. 
Um, <coughs> so just, just a couple things. Inglesby is opening in two weeks, so that's uh, um, Easter Sunday. And um, we will have communion that day. So uh, the, the elders, keep your ears tuned. We'll try to get those communion letters out to folks this week. Um, there was something else I wanted Good to... Good Friday. Oh, Good Friday. So, so Good Friday is happening. It's a 9.30, right? At, in, Minden. in Minden, at the Minden Church of the Highland Hills United Church. And you can come there and be with it live as a choir. And I'm doing the narrating, I believe, still. Yep. <laughs> so... Um, and then the plan is to re replay it at 11.15 through our YouTube channel. So I'm uh, still working on the, uh, um, the, the technical aspect of doing that, but I think that's, we, can, we can figure that out. So. Oh, yes. That's right. Stations of the Cross, which was supposed to start on Thursday or Friday, has not happened yet. <laughs> So uh, there was a delay on in uh, the making of these big signs. The printer was uh, forgot to tell them that they were behind, so they're not actually going to be up till tomorrow. So uh, starting tomorrow and maybe maybe delayed till Tuesday, we're going to get the. Remember, we got some of you got the bags with the brochures and stuff that would kind of describe. An, I don't, was there candy in those two or something? Bars. <laughs> they're little bars. Okay. So it's, it's pretty cool. So it's a way to go around, and, and the Inglesby and Lachlan churches are involved in West Guilford and Eagle Lake, and um, I think there's eight or nine of the local churches in town as well. So um, so you can come and get your bag. We'll get, we'll get the bags here uh, Tuesday sometime, and then kind of spread them around, or they can, people can come and pick them up if you want if to do that. If you one of those on the panel bench, I could announce it at choir on Tuesday. It's a festival of singers. So okay. Because there'd be a bunch of people who want to do, do you, that. Lynn? Melissa says, <laughs> if we leave a bag on the, on the piano bench, I'll announce it. she'll announce it to the Highland Festival Singers on Tuesday night. Mental note, yes. That's, it's, it, what Lynn is saying, is it locked in the tra it's, it's, it's locked in a steel trap there. Okay, I'll turn it over to Melissa. You've got to wait till he starts. And then, oh, I, this is the Stations of the Cross. Oh.
Thanks, Melissa. That was, so those were, those were actual pictures of the the uh, stations of the cross that will be posted uh, in the churches. So uh, of interest, there's a lot of interesting things going on there. They're local artists, pretty much all of them, if not pretty much. There's 14 of them, I think, and most of them, are, if not all of them, are local artists. Two of them are actually pastors in our pastor group, local pastors. They, they had talent. Ben? My mic is on. Yep. Um. Okay, what else? We're, we're, I think we're working okay. <laughs> okay, we're going to, in a sec, I'm, I'm moving down there to play my guitar because we think it'll work better for um, Melissa and I to coordinate. And we're going to sing Let's Go Up. So you can put up that first slide and as I get my guitar strapped up. This, uh, this song is it's a Robin Mark piece, as Know it. It's roughly based on those what what they call the uh, ascension songs or uh, hymns from or psalms from the Book of Psalms, where they go up to the uh, songs of ascent, the Psalm of ascent, where where the, the the Israelites would go up to Jerusalem, up to Zion, up to the temple, and there they would worship the Lord. So they go up the mountain, Mount Zion. I rejoice with those who said to me, "Let's go to the house of the Lord." Okay. I, uh, this is off my bed, so I'm using this mic instead. Which one is it on here? This is number one, and so don't don't play with that because I've turned it off. What? I'm just on this microphone. What's that microphone? What number is that? Uh, that's three. Thank you. We don't want it too too loud because no, no, it's tied into the system. Okay, let's go to page one. Let's stand up. Let's go up to the place. Of praise, where the Father pours out His grace, there is hope and peace and freedom from despair. There is grace and love in abundance. There, let's go up to His holy throne. To the one who is God alone. In the robes the Son of Righteousness has given, we can join in the song at the throne of heaven. I was glad when they said to me, In the house of the Lord, there is unity and the sound of the nation's song. Brothers in one accord, sisters singing to the Lord, all the children dancing in the kingly chorus. Let's go! 
I can see your hands strumming. That makes a big difference. Okay, I think I'm back in business. Let's, uh, where's the thing? Well, I think Ron, Ron and Debbie Bean are here today, so we'll get them to do the offering. How's that sound? Ron? <laughs> Keeps, keeps this in mind. Debbie? Okay. We give thee but thine own, whatever that it may be. All that we have is thine alone, I trust, O oh Lord, from me. Okay, let's time for prayers. And, see anything? Um, hard to hear you. Well, that, I think that was back. Initially, when you were speaking, before you started singing. Well, because I moved, changed the microphone, yeah. 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 I had, that's turned down, because when I sing, I'm a lot louder. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, Many of you know Cliff Smith. Cliff Smith's not good. He's got lung cancer. I think he's in St. Mike's, was it, we heard? Oh, Oshawa, right. You're in Oshawa General. Yeah, he's got lung cancer. And uh, so that, so Anne and Cliff, Anne sung with us in the in the singing team. And Cliff is on the board, has been on the board of stewards. They've got two, two guys, uh, Matthew and Keith. And Keith, Keith said cancer. And he's just in his 20s. But he's he's okay now. But um, so that they're in the battle. So pray for Cliff. And uh, Melissa told me this morning that we'll be, we can pray for the family of Barb Dawson. Some of you know Barb from um, I believe she was a fairly strong St. George's member. But uh, yeah, I know her now that we we think about it a bit. Um. Anything else? Okay. Let's spend some time in prayer. Let us pray. Ah, oh, Lord, we come to you because we need to, uh, to find your peace and your grace and your help in time of need. You called us to be a people of prayer, to, to mediate for others, to stand in the gap, Lord, and to, to bring all our concerns and, and burdens to you because you care for us. So, Lord, we continue to lift our concerns about the pandemic to you, it's been two years, we pray for an end, um, but also for protection while parts of it still kind of carry through the land. We think of is it BA2, the latest variant, and Lord, we pray for protection, and we pray for uh, uh, recovery for any that uh, do fall sick and ill, Lord, for comfort for those who are bereaved, Lord, for help for those involved in the, the uh, health care system. And for those who are called to make decisions, um, politically or otherwise, in various organizations to keep us, keep us well and healthy, Lord. Uh, so we put that in your, your hands, Lord, and we, we thank you for watching over us so wondrously all through these years. Lord, hear our prayer, your love, answer. And we uh, pray especially for this ongoing situation in Ukraine. We ask for an end to it. We, our hearts are heavy for citizens and, and people of Ukraine, Lord, as they suffer uh, this, this attack, and we, we lift them to you for protection, for intervention, uh, for comfort, Lord, all their needs. We, we, we put them in your hands, and we, we pray for those that are on both sides that you would protect lives, Lord, and bring an end to this, and bring, a, bring peace. Lord, we, we ask this in your name. Lord, hear our prayer. 
and in your love answer. Lord, and we pray for those on our list that uh, you might heal and help, intervene and uh, comfort, meet their needs. We think of Cliff Smith, the family of Barb Dawson, the Hood family, Corey, Don, Scott, Baby Finn, Shirley Venner, Sam, Isabel Jolly, Bernice Ross, Linda Richardson, Walt Griffin Jr., Murray Misko. Lord, hear our prayer. And we pray for Victoria Ancaster, Lisa Frost, Roly Faubert, Ushi Stouffer, Olive and Jim Waugh, Paul, Dave Paddock, Bernie and Linda Harper, Mary Sechrist, Gary Swaggerman, Kelsey Barnum, John Payne, Judy Davis, Ron Mark Jr., Mark Beach, and his wife Teresa. Lord, hear our prayer. And in your love, answer. We pray for Carol Parnell, for Kathy Bins, Amy Blanchard, Allie and Courtney, Caroline Hunter, Maureen Duquette, Chris Rusk, John Bond, Yolande Dehan, Don and Karen Tran, Darko Knezovich, Steve Wigan, others that we bring to you now in our own hearts. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to call upon Wesley to uh, lead us in our prayer and to read our, sec our last, second part of the lesson from last week. Please join with me in the prayer of illumination. Gracious, Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded through Jesus our Lord. Amen. As was already mentioned by someone listening in online, um, they are anxious to hear today's reading. <laughs> Our New Testament reading is, in fact, the continuation of what we call the prodigal son. Whenever I read this passage, I can hear my own children complaining, that's not fair. <laughs> Difficult words for a parent to hear, because sometimes fairness is not the answer. This is one such time in Luke 15, 25 to 32, a short, powerful passage. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. May these words have the power for us. Thanks, Leslie. Let's sing. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. Wait, wait till he... <laughs>
Well, Lost Kids Part 2. You recognize those guys? <laughs> John <Kessler. laughs> Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember to stay kind of like here so that we can, and I want to show that things like that. But they, can, they can't see that online, but you guys can. What's uh, I'm hunting for music for the benediction. So he's hunting for the music for the benediction. Okay. <laughs> you know this is live. When? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this story, and we ask that as we, we think about it, you would illuminate our hearts, you would pour your spirit upon us, you would teach us truths that uh, bring grace to our hearts and lives, and set us free. In your name we pray, Jesus our Lord. Amen. Yeah, so this is a continuation from last week. Oh, I need the power here. I've got the power here. Let's make sure this works. And, um, yeah, got this picture. It's a busy picture. It tells the whole story, the whole, the whole both parts of it. And uh, I'm not sure how much you can see of it. Great dead center, of course, for those that are in the church. You can see here's, oh, that's a good idea. Um, here's the main, what we call the prodigal son. So this is the father. He's got the, the glow around his head. And actually, he's back over here, too. He's, he's in two places. Interesting. So this is a very medieval, probably early medieval. We don't even know what, where this came from. Uh, and, uh, but it's got a lot of maybe kind of an Eastern European flavor to it. Um, and, and you see all the elements here. So, so here's, here's the, the, the prodigal, the younger son returned. Here's, here's the gown. Remember, we talked about this last week. You know, get, get the, my best gown and put it on. There's the gown. Oh, no, it can't. No, no, for sure. So uh, those of you online, it's that golden thing on the left side there, that gown. That's the gown. <laughs> Those people have, have the others. But, you know, if you, if you really want to get the best result, you have to come to the church. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but we're really happy to have you online. <laughs> little advertising. So um, yeah, I think these are the sandals. He's supposed to get new sandals. And this is probably the ring here up. Hold, the guy's holding over his head. Here's all the, the, the characters singing and dancing and playing their musical instruments. And this is the uh, fattened calf getting killed right there in front of us. Isn't that great? And, um, and this, this, is the young, this is the older brother here. So this is just off on the side, outside, outside the, the, uh, the, the, the main grounds of the, the house. Um, yeah, so, so what's really going on, I, I don't know how many of you have ever actually uh, butchered a, a whole animal and cooked it. They used to do this in, uh, in Lachlan, they used to have a, they called a, a wild boar roast, and they, they had a pig, and they, the, the, the gentleman especially would, would uh, roast this, they had a spit, well it's an electric spit, they weren't cranking it, <laughs> and uh, the guys would be up, like I don't know how long it took, it took like 12 to 15 hours, so they, or, or more, it might have been a whole day, I forget. So it's, it's a long process, and the guys would be there at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning basting this pig. That lasted a couple of years. <laughs> and they, they kind of burnt them out. So it was great fundraiser, good fun, but they were just exhausted. So, so, so that's a pig. So you imagine a, a, a calf. Now, apparently, they actually cut the calf up, and they would cut it up and roast it in the various ovens. But it still, it would take a big chunk of the day. So, so we're talking about, we're, we're trying to look at this, this parable, this story, from the point of view of... The, the first listeners, Jesus, who Jesus was talking to in the first century, these Jewish uh, villagers who lived in a different culture than ours, and there are a whole lot of, th th this story is powerful in and of itself, but uh, we don't understand the nuance of the cultures in which they, you know, they live. So there's a whole lot of stuff that would be perfectly clear to them, but not as clear to us. Uh, and we're going to go into that a bit in a bit of detail here today. Um, so what's going on is, meanwhile, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. But that's interesting. He heard, he heard music, and I can understand how you hear music. I'm not sure what Jesus actually meant by hearing the dancing. Or <laughs> it's just, you know, it's part of, you know, it, music and dancing go together. Or did they make a lot of noise when they danced? Because I know there are some cultures that do that, you know. Hey! And all that sort of good stuff. 
So he called so he called one of the this is verse 26 for those of you that may have Bibles that you're following along in. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Now actually, Dr. Bailey, uh, my you know mentor in this department, the, the, the resource that I'm going to, says it's not he said it's not the servant, it's a boy. And I looked it up in the old original language, which I'm not I have to look it up because I don't really know these things well, but the word is Pidon which is the same where we get pedagogy from, it's a boy. Um, <laughs> so, um, where is it? Yeah, so he called one of the boys and asked him what was going on. So the picture we have here is, uh, you know, this gathering, this, it's probably a day-long thing, the invitation's gone out to the village, and of course the children, uh, they may not be allowed to come into the center of the, of the thing, but they're all around the outside, you know, having a great old time playing and shooting shoot and yelling. So when the older brother comes in from the field, he sees one of these boys and says, come here, what's going on? Now, it's, it's very notable. I mean, the normal thing would be you heard that sort of thing going on. If you had a good, close relationship with your family, that you would just jump in and say, what's going on? What's going on? You know, you'd be excited. Not this guy. He's, he's surreptitiously finding out suspiciously what's going on, you know. So he calls the boy. <laughs> and if you hear, think of this now as a, a boy answering him. He says, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. <laughs> he's all excited because this is big party day. This is big festival time. Um, so, so that's the background. So then it says, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. Uh, key, key line. So the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So far, the elder son has. Now, there was a whole lot of implicit stuff in the, that we maybe didn't talk about last week that the locals would understand about the story. He's in the background. The older son is in the background even while the younger son has been away and coming back again. So, so far, the elder son has not sought to mediate now, I would never have thought of this or realized this without reading this book, Poet and Peasant, by, uh, by Kenneth Bailey. But the custom of the Middle East would be that in a situation where the father and the son were about to be estranged, and then the, the, the younger son says, you know, sell out, basically says, I wish you were dead, Dad, because I want my inheritance now, and it forces him to sell off his property and give him his portion, and off he goes, and he could care less if he ever sees his dad again. And he humiliates him, publicly humiliates him in the face of his servants, in the face of the, the entire community. And we talked about that last week, how, how the younger brother has shamed the dad. Now, ordinarily in that culture, the older brother would step in and stop this whole thing from happening. He would mediate. He would say, hold on a sec, you know? Like, what's going on here, guys? Can, can we not think this through? Can we not talk about this? Can we, you know, can we... He would mediate. He would get in, get in the middle of the situation and try to stop this great humiliation and great disaster from happening. He does not do any of that. And that will be notable to the first listeners. He suspiciously questioned the lad. He's like, what's going on? So he's not, he's not just jumping into the joy. He's, now he's angry. Um, he, he's upset, he's getting bitter, and he refuses to go in. So I, I have a way of, here's what he looks like. Except, he didn't have a wristwatch. Uh, okay, so here's what, you can read along with me. Here's what Bailey describes as what should have been happening here. Custom requires his presence. That's the elder brother. At such a banquet, the older son has a special semi-official responsibility. He is expected to move among the guests, offering compliments. Isn't that nice? Making sure everyone has enough to eat and probably drink, ordering the servants around and in general becoming a sort of major domo of the feast. Part of the meaning of the custom is the symbolic nature of the gesture by which the father says, my older son is your servant. My older son is your servant. To all the, you know, he's, this is a wealthy man in the community and he's, uh, you know, he, he's leading, he's, he's, he, would, he would want to be leading his son into, into the position of responsibility and authority in the family. Well, he, he does none of that, right? So the elder brother has gravely insulted and humiliated the father. <laughs> now both of them have. Because he didn't do any of the things that, that you would expect of him. So I've got a picture here, which you may or may not be able to see very well. 
Um, and just to, to, to get, give you a biblical sense of, of the shame involved here. Remember, it's, it's a shame in honor, honor culture. So for those of you in the church, and you, you can see on, uh, if you're watching at home, the, the guy on the right is King Ahasuerus. This is from the book of Esther. This is King Ahasuerus, and this is Vashti, his queen. Okay? The, the, the woman, woman on the left. So everybody knows the story of Esther, right? No? Yeah? No? Can't remember? <laughs> It, it is, has been over many centuries pr practically the favorite book of, of the Jewish people. They have more copies of it from ancient times than any other uh, uh, Old Testament book. And they love it because it's a, it's a story of ra it kind of rags to riches for one thing. It's a, it's a story of heroism. It's a, st a story of uh, uh, you know, how, how, they, how they, they, they kind of conquered in the midst of a disaster that was about to happen to the Jewish people. But in the story, the beginning of the story, King Ahasuerus, who's the emperor of, of Persia, Persia and all the, his, his huge empire, he has all his, his uh, I want to use the word cronies, that's probably not right. Let's say his princes. The princes are there for a week. They've had this huge party. They're having the greatest, best time of their lives. And he's, you know, wine was flowing full and free. <laughs> They're all happy. On day eight, he says, you know what? I'm going to bring in my queen, beautiful Queen Vashti, and show them. You know, how, how blessed I am and how, what, you know. So he, he calls his servants to bring in Queen Vashti. She refuses to come. And it's a blow. I mean, you know, he goes from the, the, you know, the heights of, of delirious joy to the, the depths of, of, uh, of depression. And like, in a second, she won't come. So then he gathers his advisors together. And what are we going to do with this? And one of the solutions might have been to have her executed. But they, they choose instead to banish her from the, the presence of the king forever, from the emperor forever. And that's, that's the background story to why he needs a new queen, and eventually Ruth becomes, this Jewish woman, becomes his new queen. Es, es, yeah, Ruth. Esther. Thank you. I, knew, I could see the wheels. Like, what? Ruth? <laughs> that's wrong. So Esther becomes his, his new queen. So, but but that's, that would be typical. That would be the way that Middle Eastern, you know, people in authority, you would expect them to act. That's what you would expect. So that's what you would expect. That's what the, uh, the peasants in Ju Jesus' day would expect um, from the father at the banquet. Let's see. Does he do that? Does it, you know, there should be a repercussion. There should be consequences for the sullenness and insolence and rebelliousness of this older brother who was supposed to be there helping. No. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Yeah. Instead. That's, again, this is sort of the turning point of the story because everybody, again, mouths dropped. He did what? <laughs> He's expected to ignore the boy and proceed with the banquet, or in some way punish him for public insolence, or at least demonstrate extreme displeasure. However, for the second time in one day, the father goes down and out of the house, offering in public humiliation a demonstration of unexpected love. The father comes out to entreat, not to scold or to rebuke, as is expected. This is from Bailey, poet and peasant. Well, insightful. So he just does exactly the opposite of what everybody there would have expected. He goes out and he entreats. Here's a little picture of him doing just that. Father on the left, older son on the right. And, and here's how he gets received when he comes out to plead and entreat. The rascal. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. Did I sound pouty enough? He starts off, look, right off the top, that would not be appropriate. You know, when you speak to your father, your honored father, you should be calling him a father or honored father, right? And they would pick up on this immediately. What? He, doesn't, he doesn't even give his father the respect of uh, you know, a, a, a title when he addresses him. All these years I've been slaving for you. Has he? You know, he's, he's the main guy that runs the entire farm and estate, and he has it all, and, and he's slaving for his father. Uh, and never disobeyed your orders. Really? He didn't, he didn't help when the, the younger brother was taken off and the father was heartbroken. I guess maybe he didn't get told to do that, but normally he should. He wasn't the major domo when he came back. Yet you never gave me even a young goat 
So, so he's, he's comparing here, right? He, he, my, my other brother, he got, my younger brother, he got this fattened calf. I don't know how big a fattened calf is. Some of you are farmers, so it's a big animal, right? It's good size, hundreds of pounds. And a little kid, it's just a little itty bitty thing like this. Uh, so I could celebrate with my friends. He's not interested in celebrating with the family, you know. He just wants to go out by himself. But when this son of yours, notice we, he doesn't call him what? My brother. <laughs> right. When this son of yours, I talked about this last week, sometimes when one of us, our kids are not really behaving that well, we might say, one of us spouses might say, that your, your, look what your son is up to or your daughter is up to. So he does it here too. The son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home. Actually, there's never been any mention of prostitutes till now. So he's make, either making this up or he's you know, somehow trying to slander his brother. You kill the fattened calf for him. So he, he's, not, uh, he's, not, uh, he's not bending at all, is he? We don't see much repentance at all yet. He's, he's got this grand sense of entitlement, and he, uh, he will not bend. Here's, a, here's a, a kind of cool little graphic, just a little picture of this. Um, maybe a better title for the story, rather than the prodigal son, would be the parable of the father and the two lost sons. Because it's mainly about the father. Jesus is seeking to demonstrate to us what God is like, how he treats us when we are wayward. And we are wayward in many different kind of ways. Some of us are like the younger son, and some of us are like the older son, and many of us are a bit of both. I mean us. I'm not kidding. If you know something about yourself, you'll know that's true. Uh, so he, he, uh, here's my little flush. So it's working. Okay, there, so there's dad with a tear in his eye. Here's a son that's in the house, and he's looking away from the dad. And here's the, lost, the other lost son, and he's gone far away from the dad. So it's, it's a kind of a great graphic. Parable of the father and the two lost sons. Dad already has a servant in the person of this young man. He wants a son. God wants children. The father bypasses the omission of a title, the bitterness, the arrogance, the insult, the distortion of fact, and the unjust accusations. He just bypasses it. There is no judgment, no criticism, no rejection, but only an outpouring of love. We tend to gloss over the old, older brother when we read this story, but it, it may be actually more uh, to the point for us. And so he says... This is him, his response. Does he get angry? Does he fiercely say, he says, my son, my son. He addresses him appropriately. You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead. and He's alive again. He was lost and is found. Wow. So the whole thing's gone full circle. Um, if you recall the beginning of the story, the reason Jesus told these parables, the three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost sons, um, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. This is the beginning of chapter 15. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So as far as the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the scribes, are concerned, is, uh, you know, these guys are the lowest of the low, and Jesus is hanging out with them. Now, they are represented by the, the younger brother in the story. And the Pharisees and scribes are, of course, represented by the older brother in the story. And so what Jesus has done, essentially, is, is turned the whole thing around. Uh, and now, they are the ones who are repentant and therefore close to the Father. And the Pharisees and the scribes are kind of, we don't know what's going on with them. And so, I put a question mark. We, we don't even know if they, they repent in this story. And that's deliberate. They seem to remain lost. And they represent, sometimes and in some ways, they may better represent a lot of us who, you know, are well-churched and religious and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're on the inside. We've stayed on the farm. We haven't gone off and done crazy stuff. So, but, but what's our attitude about that? I mean, it's, it's fine to do that. I'm glad. I was... Didn't really get too wild myself, fortunately, because it's, it's destructive on a body. <laughs> but uh, 
You know, I know that I've definitely got some of the older brother uh, attitude from time to time. And, and in the season of repentance, we're called to not just repent of those things that are obvious, you know, just re- obvious rebelliousness, but attitudes of entitlement and, and attitudes of uh, superiority and attitudes of judgmentalism, which is represented by this elder brother. And it, all it does is divide us. In this world where there's so much division going on, and, you know, one group against the other group and, and pointing at them and accusing them, that's exactly what goes on in the story. Jesus is calling us out on that because he's calling us to unity, calling us to know that we all have the one Father, and he loves us all unconditionally, and Christ died for us all unconditionally. Last picture. So this is, this is a very famous painting by Rembrandt. I believe it's called The Return of the Prodigal. And uh, Henry Nowen wrote a book by the same name, and I, I read the book, and he, he was inspired by the painting. It's in Moscow. I was thinking maybe it would be nice if Putin hung it in his... Anyway. Uh, <laughs> and, and maybe really concentrated on it and thought about it. Um, so where's my pointer again? But you can see who's who here pretty much. This is the father, you know, on the left at the top. And if you could see it better, you know, his, his faith is he's sorrowful and yet he's full of compassion and, and patience and long-suffering. And here's the prodigal, uh, the, the younger son who's, who's come home and he's actually repented. He doesn't, his shoes are falling off his feet here. Good, good touch. And, of course, up on the right side, kind of aloof from the whole thing, is the elder brother looking on. You know, he's not too impressed. He's very judgmental. He's disdainful. Hmm. It's an amazing picture. And so now now wrote his book, The Return of the Prodigal, and basically he ends up saying, I, I ended, he says, I ended up identifying with all three. <laughs> I can understand what the, what the father's going through because of my life experience, and I can understand what the prodigal was, was going on with him because of my life experience, and I can understand what the elder brother is all about because of my life experience. Because there's some of that in all of us. So it's an amazing story, like... I think it was uh, Leslie said, just amazing story, but it's, it's, it's compact, but it's just powerful. And uh, it's, it's lasted and it's relevant low these 2,000 years down the road. It's an amazing story. And it tells it like it is today as it did back in Jesus' day. What a storyteller. Truth sets us free, guys. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this, your story. So revealing, so true, so timeless. May you help us to see ourselves in in this, Lord, and and understand more and more what a what a wondrous, forgiving, gracious, patient Father we have. One who would even give up His only Son to die for us all. Or help us to have humble hearts before You, and recognize that You love us all. Lord, we ask it in Your name, Jesus Christ, our Lord, You who taught us in prayer to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We're going to close off with When I survey the wondrous cross on which the King of Glory died, Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us, both now and always. Amen.